Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm, I'm here today with uh, a good friend and a wonderful scholar, uh, David Correa, who is an associate professor in the Department of American Studies at UNM, who writes and teaches in areas of, of environmental politics and, and violence in the law, whose recent book, uh, Properties of Violence, I highly recommend that you read. Um, David's also been a major player in galvanizing public opinion about what many of us in our town recognize to be pretty classic bully behavior uh, on the part of, uh, of, of the APD and its uh, unconstitutional use of lethal and non-lethal violence. He's written a really wonderful analytical piece on the DOJ and Albuquerque's uh, consent agreement that has run in um, in a online magazine that he is the managing editor of La, La, La Jicorita out of El Rito, New Mexico. I urge you to go uh, read his piece. Uh, today we're gonna we're gonna try to unravel this consent agreement. It's really great to have you with us. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. When you read uh, the DOJ Albuquerque Consent Agreement, you see right in the executive summaries, about, I think number eight, where uh, where it said that the um, uh, that the city does not concede the accuracy of, of the allegations made by the Justice Department of unconstitutional use of lethal and non-lethal force. And it also says, of course, the agreement should not be construed as, as an admission of uh, or evidence of li liability under under federal state or municipal law, including but not limited to, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, this sort of sets the tone, I think, for the whole thing. And I know you have some very critical uh, uh, points of view about this, and I'd love to get right into them. What do you think is will be the role of the monitor? And what, ha what are his powers? And what has he been sort of, has he been kind of thrown to the wolves? Yeah, well, we're going to have to find out uh, who that monitor is. Um, it'll take a while. Uh, I, I doubt that they've officially begun talking about who the monitor will be. Uh, there's, a, there's a process through which people can, can uh, apply, uh -huh. can nominate themselves. I think, I think that um, the thing that's most clear to me in reading this 106-page agreement, which is supposed to finally resolve the problem of police violence, it's supposed to really take everything we learned about APD in that findings letter released by the Department of Justice in April and, and make it binding, legally binding, and force the city to do those things. But we're, we're not really going to know during the course of the four years, at a minimum, that this agreement is in place, um, what the monitor is doing to monitor compliance and to ensure that APD is living up to the agreement because nothing is going to be made public. Uh, if you read the document closely, you see first and foremost, and this is true of all the consent decrees that the DOJ has signed over the last few years, New Orleans, um, Seattle, and others, uh, the, D the monitor will have no public um, profile. Nothing the monitor says publicly to the press or to anyone else um, well, they can't actually talk to the press unless they actually get express permission from the city and the Department of Justice. There'll be a series of reports that the monitor will have to release, but uh, when you look at the language of the agreement and then you look at the language of the, the other agreements that the city, or that the DOJ has signed with other cities, um, there's, there's, it's possible for the city to redact quite a bit of information. Anything that the city claims is or should be confidential. Uh, and it doesn't explain in the consent decree who will determine what is or isn't confidential, what are the uh, elements that will go into a determination of confidentiality that would result in a redaction from report. Now, it's not clear. It might be, it might be clear to them, but it wasn't clear to me reading what, what will or won't be redacted. So, and also all of the reporting that the consent decree requires the city to do, none of that can is required to be public. So we will have limited access, number one, to what kind of work the monitor is doing, 
we will have no access to the monitor personally. Even though the monitor is required in this agreement to have meetings with community stakeholders, it doesn't say who those community stakeholders are, how they're to be determined and located, um, if they have access to any of this information. None of that's clear. The only thing that's clear is the monitor uh, does have authority to force compliance, can call on the courts to force the city to do it if they're recalcitrant, um, and will release information, but some of that information can be redacted. So if, we, if people hope that we're getting someone that's going to occupy a bully pulpit and, and really have a public uh, persona in this effort, they're going to be disappointed because that's not what this monitor is going to, going to be. And so, you know, it, it almost, this agreement almost guarantees that we're going to get um, either someone that's sort of a career administrator or a technocrat, someone used to doing things um, by the book and behind the curtains. And, and, you know, we might get a good one, but certainly the city is going to go out of their way to make sure that that person um, is a bean counter, right, and not a, and not a real critic of the kind of unconstitutional policing that this department's doing. Hopefully the, the DOJ will be tough, will we'll require that, that we get someone in there with a backbone, someone uh, maybe with a political weight to tell the mayor to sit down and shut up. Because uh, that's what we're going to need. We're going to need somebody with that kind of ability. And, I, and I'm not confident that we'll get it. Um, I think when you're dealing with the APD, it's best to be pessimistic. Yes. And that's, that's, I think, the position we're in with the federal monitor. Well, obviously, the mayor still thinks that all of these allegations are unfounded. Uh, he certainly hasn't fessed up to anything. The, uh, the monitor, uh, from my reading, I couldn't find a budget for him. I couldn't find a staff a staffing uh, provision for him. I don't know what the what his his own research capacities might be. As it seems now, as you pointed out, he's he's going to have to rely on data supplied exclusively by the APD. Is that is that your reading? The agreement does require that the monitor develop a work plan and submit it to the court. So the monitor, it's it's very it's possible that the monitor could could um, clearly identify. Um, self-reporting by APD is a troubling issue and that, yeah. that he or she might have to go and find that information elsewhere. In fact, in the New Orleans consent decree, it's very, the language is very specific that the monitor is not only going to rely on the New Orleans Police Department for that data, but rely on other agencies and, and organizations and its own investigators. So that, in, that language for some reason is not in this consent decree for Albuquerque. And if you read the agreement, like I've done a few times closely, it's clear that the only way the monitor is going to get information is it is that self-reported yeah. by APD. So, uh, you know that's uh, that's troubling. Th there there's no um, I, there's no budget that's included. It just says that the city is going to have to cover all the costs of the monitor and his or her investigative team. There's going to be a team involved here. It's not one person. And there's even the only number in the consent degree is a, is a hundred thousand dollar figure set aside if the monitor decides that they need outside consultants to help, or if the city or DOJ decides they need some sort of consultant assistance on top of the monitor. But whatever the monitor is going to charge, that, that's entirely going to be the city's responsibility. And it will likely be a negotiation once the monitor is selected. So when I was reading your piece, uh, I was struck by, the, um, by, by really what you what you presented to us as a kind of a self-evident reality, and it is, is that is that APD practically wrote this thing, designed it, uh, agreed to what it, it wanted to do, uh, that barring some extraordinary personage to take over this role as a monitor, the APD will be policing itself, providing all the data. Uh, and uh, that very troubling to me, and I know it is to you too, because this is what's been going on forever. Could you sort of... Yeah, it was, it was I guess it was a, a surprise um, to me when I first read this agreement, how, how much authority the agreement gives to APD to design the solutions to the problems it created. And in fact, I, I um, you know, just, just hours after it was released, uh, a former 
APD officer texted me and called this bullshit. <laughs> you know, that was, and, and, and I, you know, I went back to it after I got that text. And I, right, let me read this even again, because I kind of agree. And I want to make sure that this isn't just some sort of reaction. Um, but it, it's, it's troubling because I think, uh, I mean, you know, in April, when the, the um, findings letter was released, this 46 page document, just damning the Albuquerque Police Department for engaging, routinely engaging in unconstitutional policing and almost on a regular basis using unjustified lethal and non-lethal force. The one disappointing thing that I brought up at the time as well was that, that it just sort of stopped short then of saying this is what needs to happen. There was a series of recommendations. And, you know, the, the criticism I got back from people were like, well, you're, you're, you're wrong because this is not what this document's for. That findings letter is just supposed to establish the conditions through which negotiations will happen that will result in a consent decree. And that consent decree will be that legally binding document that will force these changes with APD. And that's what I, and I think a lot of people expected when we were reading this consent decree, um, we were wrong. You know, it's a consent decree premised on the notion that APD can and will design policies and restrict practices to bring them in line with the kind of constitutional policing DOJ expects. And according, I guess, in the logic of DOJ, we have this monitor in this court to, to ensure compliance. So, so in other words, even though they've never done this before in the entire history of this police agency, even though they've, they've um, uh, willfully ignored their own policies and practices in the past, somehow magically, um, they're going to get it together and resolve this generations long problem of racialized, violent, unconstitutional policing. And I don't believe them. I don't think there's a chance in hell they're going to do this. And I, and, and I think this is going to be uh, a real a nightmare like it's been in Seattle and New Orleans, right? Just yesterday, um, you know, uh, an, uh, an independent investigator re revealed in New Orleans that the police department doesn't even, doesn't even investigate sex crimes, oh. right? right th this is an agency too that has been under this consent decree. It just started last year right, in New Orleans. So I was really surprised. I expected that the DOJ would say, here are policies, implement them. Here are practices, change them. And this is how we want to change them. There are places in the consent decree it does that, but too few. And ultimately, if this thing is going to work, it's going to be because somehow, miraculously, the very people who have refused to take responsibility and hold themselves and others accountable are suddenly going to choose to do that. And that's, that's the position we're in. We're going to have to just hope for that. So as I look at this thing, I... It seems to me, and it seems to Benito too, that none of the none of the deaths and precious few of the shootings, I think, I think there have been 40 we're now dealing with or more, uh, would really have anything to do with with this document. The, the crisis intervention, which I know you've really analyzed really closely, uh, uh, seems to be a, a joke. Uh, so, so here we have a really, in my in my view anyway, a kind of a playground, a murderous playground of bullies beating up on defenseless people, right and left, killing probably 25 of those people who have been shot, uh, had mental health and homeless problems. Uh, and, and here you have a document which doesn't address any of that. Is that, is that a fair reading? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't address this specifically in my analysis yeah. of the consent decree, but I, I've been thinking about this over the last few days. And I think a really useful way of considering the value and the and the um, and the possibility of this consent decree um, would be to consider what would happen in what would happen this year, or next year, if another James Boyd incident happens, yes. Yes. or if another incident like that happened to Christopher Torres or Ken Ellis the Third or Alan Gomez. What would happen? And, and, and if you read the, the document carefully, you realize that um, those would still be considered justified uses of force. Because at, at every point in the agreement, and, and in particular the use of force section, which in my mind the use of force section and the crisis intervention sections of this document are the most important ones. 
as you point out, that's really where the problem is, obviously. In every one, there are specific expectations of improvement at APD that DOJ identifies with very specific language that APD will not use chokeholds, that APD will not use electronic control weapons, that AP, APD will not use various methods of force. And then there's always, it's always followed by the clause, unless the, you know, unless the objective threat to the officer, unless it, it's necessary to protect the lives of them and others. In other words, and this has always been the problem with not just APD, but, but the use of unjustified force by police officers nationwide, as long as the officer personally feels threatened or that someone else is threatened, they're justified in their use of lethal force. And so, you know, James Boyd had knives, despite the fact that they were two small four-inch knives he was using to protect himself against a, a dog that they were sicking on him. Uh, and and uh, and there was an entire SWAT team with combat equipment and, and submachine guns and rocket launchers, <laughs> grenade launchers. He was a threat. He was it, it, that would be considered an objective threat that would give them the authority to use lethal force. This document doesn't make those fatal encounters unjustified. It, it doesn't do that. It it it. And I understand that the DOJ thinks that we can't ham, ham, you know, we can't just handcuff officers who sometimes we ask to, to put themselves in harm's way. I get that. I, I understand all that. You know, I, I've talked to police officers. My, my grandfather was a police officer. My uncle was a police officer. My brother, brother-in-law is a police officer. I, I, I get all that. I, I don't think any of us want to put people in harm's way. No. But we, we, we have to really be honest about what the problem is and what the solution is. And the solution in this department is not leave it up to the guys on the street because they're making the wrong decisions. And they have, not all of them, but too often and too many of them. And the, the DOJ report, uh, consent decree here doesn't really address that. You know, I mean, ultimately, you know, those, those tragic um, deaths and those families that are grieving and, and will be grieving for the lives lost um you know there's nothing really this 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 consent decree i don't think really confronts that painful history in our city and it's not going to do anything to give us any sort of accountability we, we really needed i think a tough consent decree and we didn't get it the pattern that is that is so clear here is that the people with a lot of power beat up on people with absolutely no power it's a it's a you know, it's almost a psychological condition. It's a, it's a group behavior. It's a, it's a mindset. But one of the things that I know we all hoped for was that the DOJ would tailor this, this consent decree to us. But you point out very wisely that this, a lot of this is boilerplate stuff. And uh, could you reflect on that a little bit too? I, yeah, that, um, I noticed at the press conference releasing the consent decree that the U.S. Attorney for New Mexico, Damon Martinez, was very clear that this is not a boilerplate agreement. This is tailored specifically to the problems in Albuquerque, and and much of the agreement does do that, but too much of it, and in precisely the the most troubling areas of policing, are just complete boilerplate language pulled out of other consent decrees. So the entire, almost the entire use of force section is verbatim in the New Orleans consent decree. The entire description of the federal monitor, the role of the monitor, the work of the monitor, is, uh, is entirely cribbed from the New Orleans um, consent decree. And, and as I point out in, in the piece I wrote, I'm sure that if I were to say this to, to Damon Martinez, he would probably say to me, well, look, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. This is really, this is, this is best practice. These are policies that work and we need, so we're not going to start over from this Right. And, and I think to some degree there's truth in that. But ultimately, um, the problems at APD are very specific around crisis intervention and use of force. And we need to be very specific about them. It's different than what's going on in New Orleans, although there's similarities. And we needed very specific language. It, this is not a department capable of resolving the problems they've created. We don't have leaders at APD able or willing to make the tough choices to be really strong leaders, to get us out of this mess. mess. They got us in it. They got us in this mess. 
you know, and, and, and I think most of all, we have a police chief in Gordon Eden who is happy to be bullied by, you know, the city. And Rob Perry, who's the chief administrative officer, um, basically runs the show over there and bullies the, the police chief. And, I mean, if you look at the video of the May 5th council meeting when we issued a police, a people's arrest warrant for, for Chief Eden, uh, you could see him being ordered around by the chief administrative officer, Rob Perry. This, this, you know, he's, he seems like probably a very nice person, but he doesn't have the backbone that we need to really get this done. And so we have this, this agreement that leaves open the door for people who, who don't have, uh, I think the, the, the intelligence or, uh, the emotional, uh, uh, I think maturity to to honestly confront or even know how to honestly confront the problem. You know, it's it's shocking because there's a there's a in the in the uh, analysis I wrote, I I, I said I, I was laughing out loud so many times that my daughter in the other room thought that I was watching a sitcom or something. Like that. And it's true. And there it was this one section I laughed out loud. I didn't, I didn't add this to my piece. But, where the the in very it's the, the language is very formal and almost stilted, right? It's a very legalese kind of language, but it, it basically was saying the Albuquerque Police Department was required to write some policies, to write them down, <laughs> and, to, and to like put them in a three ring binder. I mean, it was like very specific, and then show everyone, look, we've got some policies, you know. And I just was laughing when I read that. Like in other words. <laughs> It, 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 they, they've never even thought, maybe we should actually write some of these policies down. down. <laughs> maybe we should ask some of our officers to read these policies and be familiar with them, right? I mean, as a as a professor, when I start a class, I have a syllabus. <laughs> I mean, what's this all about? Like, what is the, what are your what are your responsibilities, students? Well, read the syllabus. <laughs> Nothing like that happens in ABG. It, it's it's it, it's not something that that's ever occurred to these people in leadership positions at APD. And mostly it's because, you know, and what we've learned about APD is that the leaders at APD, the people who get promoted are the people that come out of the really aggressive units like SWAT, K-9, ROPE, the bomb squad. If you get, if you get experience in these really aggressive, military-focused units, that's how you get promoted. And these are units that just, they don't have a plan. They just, they, I mean, it's just like, let's get out there and let's, you know... And that was another thing in the agreement. Like, let's have, how about you should have pre-meetings before deploying SWAT, post-meetings where you debrief. They don't do that on a regular basis. I mean, that's how um, Alan Gomez was killed, was that a member of SWAT just showed up, drove his car to this. To this. It wasn't like they arrived together, they had a plan. He just drove up, pulled out his gun, and shot Alan Gomez. So to think that that people in leadership positions at APD who, who have never even thought it important to promulgate policies to guarantee constitutional policing can now suddenly do it is absurd. And, you know, it's, it's ultimately, I think, going to be a really tough job for the monitor. This is not going to be a simple thing. I see us coming to a head six years from now when the city is going to try to sue the DOJ yeah. to end this. Um, I mean, that will only be if we have a tough monitor that refused to let him off the hook after four years. And, and that's, I think, where we're headed. So we know that, that Chief Eden uh, used to run the police academy, the, uh, the state's police academy. We know they're, they're under a lot of pressure and a lot of analysis right now because they're, there's cheating scandals and other kinds of things. Could you comment on, on the appropriateness of this teacher being, <laughs> being the head and the leader of, of, of reforming? Our police department. Yeah, I think that there's a couple of problems with 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 this agreement, and and it's not objectively part of the agreement, but it, it should have been something that the DOJ recognized and clearly either didn't recognize or ignored. But it's the fact that you have someone like Chief Eden in charge at APD, and he has no experience running a municipal police department, right? As you point out, he was in Mexico public safety, he was in Santa Fe. He had ultimate authority over training, training that we know has failed in every possible way, you know, from the cheating scandals where they were just giving officers the answers to the tests um, to their refusal to release information publicly about the training 
to, um, you know, to, to basically train officers as though everyone's um, armed, including children, um, to, to make sure that we have this sort of aggressive policing in the state. Uh, and that's, that's his experience. He doesn't have any experience uh, leading a municipal police department, much less reforming a municipal police department. I think we need someone with some real long experience at community policing, someone who's committed to community policing, not committed to these ridiculous dog and pony shows of public meetings where he's going to... I mean, one of the ridiculous things in this consent decree is that now every single officer is required over the first two years of the agreement to go to public meetings. They, they, they have to go. It's, it's like the teacher's telling them to go to these meetings. So the next time you're at your neighborhood association meeting, if you see a cop in the corner bored looking at his cell phone, it's because he's forced to be there. You don't, you don't accomplish community policing by forcing your officers to engage the community. You hire officers who want to do that and are trained to do that. And we don't have that. We instead have a guy like Chief Eden, who is who comes out of a, a milieu, first of all, of secrecy. He, he was a U.S. Marshal. There's one agency that you can never get information out of. It's the U.S. Marshals. So he's trained, you know, keep play close to the vest. Don't tell anyone anything. Don't give any information out. And secondly, he spent a lot of time in Santa Fe defending uh, training policies that have directly contributed to the problems of unconstitutional policing in Albuquerque. And, and that's, that's the position we're in. That's our leader. That's the guy who's going to have ultimate authority to make this thing work. And that's the one thing we knew couldn't happen. And that happened. Well, we also know that, that a good number of his students, if you will, at the academy are also in the APA. So, we have, so when we talk about crisis intervention, what comes to mind is one of, one of the shooters of James Boyd was heard to say on some tapes that were recently listened to, for some, I believe that's the case, saying that this guy is a, if, if you pardon my French, a fucking lunatic and ought to be shot. Now, this is not my view of crisis intervention. Um, what, what, what does the consent agreement say about that? And how do you think we ought to be doing it? It's a, it's a long section in the consent to grant crisis intervention. And uh, let's take up two elements of that. First is uh, very clear language in the agreement requiring extensive training in crisis intervention. I think that this, this it's, it's, it's a problem, I think, to think of crisis intervention as uh, a different kind of training other than what the officer should be trained at in the beginning. That's the whole point. Right, this should be the whole point of what it should be. It should be embedded in the curriculum, basically. It shouldn't be all. Oh, let's give them an extra forty hours of crisis intervention training. Let's make sure supervisors have crisis intervention training, and let's and let's let APD design that crisis intervention training. That's literally what this agreement. This that was another place I laughed out loud when it said that APD will train their officers in leadership and ethics. You know, so so am I to understand that Gordon Eden, Rob Perry are now going to design ethics training for, for officers in APD. That's what the agreement suggests to me. But, but even more troubling to me is language about COAST. And COAST is a, a, a civilian unit of APD. The acronym stands for Community Outreach, and uh, it always confuses me what this, what the, it's, it's basically a community outreach um, and, and like crisis intervention team, civilians, who are supposed to go out, work with APD officers to help identify people who are in mental health crisis or need mental health services and to get them those services. And I don't know any of the um, members of that team personally. I've seen them working on the street, I've talked to people who have encountered COAST. And as I say in the piece, COAST is, is almost universally despised. Not, not that people themselves are despised, because I'm sure that they, you know, they probably take their jobs very seriously and they want to help. But it's, it's seen as a plainclothes unit of APD that just goes out to look for warrants and then calls the cops when they find warrants and people get arrested. Homeless people. Maybe. Homeless people. It's almost entirely homeless people. 
I mean, of the, the, the native homeless people I've talked to recently, um, they don't want to have anything to do with coast. In fact, they're, they're more likely to try to avoid contact with coast than with cops because, you know, with cops, they might be so busy that they're not going to go around and check everyone for warrants. Whereas that's all coast does is checking everyone who are you, you know, and, and I'm sure that this is not, um, uh, uh, institutionalized in the work that coast does, but I think coast has become a, a unit much like rope, the repeat offender program or repeat offender project that APD is now disbanding because it turned into a kind of a gang. It started out as this sort of unit that would focus on repeat offenders to try to make sure that they were being monitored, to make sure we're keeping track of people that that were running afoul of the law on a regular basis and were dangerous. And, you know, they turned into this sort of like mini SWAT unit. And 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 Keith Keith Sandy, who shot and killed James Boyd, was a member of Rope. So, and they used a noose as their internal, on, as on the letterhead of their memos. And, and when, I think when KRQE or the Albuquerque Journal asked about that, you know, do you understand what the reference here would be, you know? You, you know, most of the people that you're working with are people of color and you're using a noose. And their answer was, well, I'm not, a, I'm not expert, so I can't comment. On so they're tone deaf, right, to what they're doing. So the problem, but I think the problem really here with COSA is if we really care about connecting people to mental health services and if we really care about getting people who are on the street the services they need, whatever that is, APD can't do it. We can't have that unit connected whatsoever to the police department, because as soon as they're underneath the auspices of the police department, they're working with and for the police. And we don't have a community-based police department that people on the street trust. And so we'd have to separate that, put a firewall between the work Coast does, right? That the people on the street, they should be advocates for the people on the street like a lawyer would be, right? I mean, when they're in, if they find themselves in court, their public defenders are not in any way working with APD. Yes. And so too should be the people that we're sending out into the street that the city is paying to send out into the street to connect those people to services. Because APD doesn't do that. They're not doing that right now. They might in the future if we're lucky and this works and we have a department reorganized around community policing. But right now they don't. And so crisis intervention right now is broken. And this consent decree is not going to fix it because... This con consent decree really expands the mission of Coast, really increases the um, the increases the mission of Coast, and and doesn't say anything about really divorcing that mission from the mission of the Albuquerque Police Department, which has never been one to serve the interest of people living on the street. They're criminalized. You know, we have a mayor who made it clear when he came into office that he was going to be a law and order mayor. He was going to clean up the streets. They're too dangerous. It was this sort of broken windows approach to policing. And they, as a result, are very aggressive with people on the street. I have, I've been interviewing folks on the street for the last few weeks, and I haven't met a single native man who hasn't been assaulted by a police officer. Oh and we're not talking about in the course of arrest. I'm talking about just harass assaulted, beaten, um, cuffed, beaten, and then uncuffed and released miles from where they were picked up. This is a regular occurrence. And, you know, it's much worse than we think. With the last couple years, we've been focusing on the problem of unjustified lethal force. But the unjustified use of non-lethal force is endemic and pervasive and really frightening if you're living on the street. And the last thing they're going to do is trust anyone at all connected with APD. And if that's the only way we're trying to provide services to people on the street, um, or at least if that's the only way the city's doing it, then the city is failing in that at that and will continue to fail at that. So, you know, we know that, that um, or we hear, you know, that there are 100 gangs in Albuquerque. We know that we have a tremendous crime problem here. We know there's a lot of violence. Uh, but it's curious that, indeed, we never read about gang members being violently assaulted and uh, and even lethally assaulted. We never never really see anything. Now, this may be the fault of the media. I'm not sure. But it does seem to me that all, almost all of the lethal violence has been confined to a particular hopeless and helpless population. That, um, that the police department 
has really, it's not even meant to be dealing with, basically. Uh, this is a whole other issue. Uh, so, what do we need to do? What can we do? What's a better approach? And can we, can we adapt this consent, agree, uh, this consent agreement to do it? In, in early June, I was invited to a meeting at the U.S. Attorney's Office, large meeting. There was probably 50 people there. They, the DOJ was there as well, and they were inviting a real large cross-section of the community um, as they were getting ready to begin negotiations for the consent decree. And it was really one of these sort of last times for the DOJ to say, what, 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 what do we need to be doing in this negotiation? What should this consent decree look like? And... I wrote about this in La Jicarita in, in mid-June, but I was struck in that meeting by the, 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 the absolute total agreement in this room, uh, the 50 people that represented nonprofits, community-based organizations, there were activists, elected political leaders, lawyers. I mean, it was a really interesting uh, cross-section of the, I think, peace and justice community and, and, the, and even the business community was there. And everyone agreed, we don't trust the city and we don't trust the DOJ in these, in these negotiations. We want to be in that room. We want to be a part of those negotiations. And that was a non-starter. I mean, after three hours of people saying, this is what we want and this is how we want it, we want to have our representatives in that room, part of the negotiation, or at the very least, observing that negotiation, reporting back to us. And at the end of that, like three hours of describing what we wanted and what it was going to look like, Damien, Damien Martinez, the U.S. attorney, said, nope, <laughs> that's never going to happen. That's never going to happen. He's like, there's no way I could trust the, 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 that negotiation to work well if it's not confidential. I mean, these are legitimate concerns. I understood what he was saying. But ultimately, the reason why this whole group agreed that we needed to be someone that people trusted needed to be in that room was because I think we feared we'd get this agreement. And what we get, what we have here is agreement once again. I mean, this, we could go back to the nineties, the late nineties after the Walker Luna report. This is the same thing that happened then this crisis report reforms. Okay. APD now straighten things out. And they didn't. And so, you know, if, if there had been a way to construct this negotiation so that, that, that community groups and activists and peace and justice, the peace and justice community could have been somehow a part of it. We could have seen the direction it was going and we could have said, okay, hold on a second. There's, this is a non-starter. You cannot produce a consent decree that leaves it up to APD to design the solution to the problem they created. Rather, what we, and okay, DOJ, you're not, you're not comfortable imposing specific policies and prohibiting a variety of practices. Okay, then, Let's create an independent commission and let's, let's give, let's, let's populate that commission with people not connected with the police department here or the administration. And let's charge that commission with writing those policies that the consent decree says APD gets to write with identifying the problems and prohibiting the practices that the consent decree lets APD do. And then let's impose that on the police department. That would have been the way to do that. You know, the, the agreement creates a force review board. It creates a mental health advisory committee. And these, these bodies will, will operate during the course of this consent agreement to produce, to promulgate the kind of policies and to produce the kinds of outcomes that we want. They are entirely controlled by APD, those bodies. I mean, only the mental health advisory committee or board will include community representation. But APD will decide who that community representation is. That's the wrong way to do this. What it, DOJ should have done, and this is why I was very critical of Damon Martinez when he said this was tailored to APD. It was not tailored to APD. If this were tailored to APD, then the Department of Justice would have recognized that this is not a new problem. It goes back to the 60s and the 70s. There have been previous efforts to resolve the problem. Often those efforts leave it up to APD to design the solutions. They never do it. Right? They'll design those solutions, but then they'll ignore them. Then they'll have new leaders will come in and they'll just undo all the work that other ones have done. If they had really recognized that this is an historical issue, this is not just new, it's systemic and it's intractable and it can't be solved by APD, then we, they would have started by saying, all right, 
this agreement creates this body that will have binding authority to impose the kind of policy changes and the kind of practices that will guarantee constitutional policing and community-based policing. We didn't get that. And, and partly, I think it's a function of the sort of the secrecy of the negotiations, uh, the way the city has refused to acknowledge any of the problems, even, at, even as you point out, even to date, they refuse to acknowledge these as real problems. And, and I know that, that this would have made for a difficult negotiation. The city would never have wanted to agree yeah. to give authority to a non-APD promulgated board to impose policies. But that's how bad things are. And it, it would have been worth going to court to sue APD. You know, this, this agreement basically is a way to avoid yeah. going to court and forcing APD to make these changes. And if there would have been people from this community, people who have been working on this for years and years and years, they would have said, this is a non-starter. I'd rather go to court and risk losing than l leaving all this up yeah. to APD. And, you know, the DOJ isn't familiar with that history. Yeah. I mean... It, that history didn't figure into their April findings letter. That history doesn't figure into this consent decree. And and I think ultimately as a result of that, because we're ignoring that history, we're going to keep living it. I wish we could talk longer about this. I think we have probably three or four more conversations over the next next two or three years. I know you're going to be looking at it very carefully. The Mercury will be too. Um, I'm so hopeful that... that um, that the community will also stay involved and keep looking. Uh, the federal court is a has a strange way of working on things. It's a very powerful thing when it wants to be. It can be devastating. Uh, but of course, this consent decree is a federal court document. Um, it's not possible, I suppose, for a community to raise the kind of money to get the kind of legal fees uh, to actually pursue uh, the federal implications of failing to follow this. Uh, but that's what's going to probably have to happen. They're going to have to have an outside suit. I thought you've been very, very incisive today, and I really appreciate your analysis. Thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Thanks for covering this issue like you have.